The reading of God's word this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 4, I'll read from verse 1 through verse 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up unto the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, It is written again, or it is also written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and said to him, All these I will give you if you will just fall down, worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for... It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are continuing in a Lenten sermon series that is focused on understanding what Lent is and how to observe it faithfully. Lent is preparing for Easter by seeking God in a way that is intentional rather than casual. There was a time when the kingdom of Judah was in apostasy, that is, drifting from God, and a prophet came to the king and said, basically, if you would just seek if you would quit being so casual about your relationship with God and and seek God, you'll find Him. And the kingdom won't fall apart like it has been. And uh, this is a verse of Scripture we read a few weeks ago. And the king responded in two very specific, clear, easy-to-understand ways. He took a walk through the hills and valleys of his kingdom, and he tore down the idols those things that were distracting the people from God. And he rebuilt the altars. So we're focusing continually on this idea. We're going to talk a bit today about some idols we can tear down and an altar we can build back up. One of the reasons, if you recall within that scripture a few weeks ago, that Judah had built idols to begin with, idols of um, worship to, say, the fertility gods, such as um, an Ashtar pole, was because of their envy of the nations around them. They were not content with what God had blessed them with because of what they saw other nations up to. had nothing to do with what they had. They had plenty. It was mainly because of their view of what they saw in other nations. And because of their envy, they built up these idols. So I hinted a few weeks ago that watch out for the things that are on the list of the seven deadly sins, such as envy. For that may be the thing which, quite literally, erects idols in your life. So I thought, how about reflecting on, specifically, the seven deadly sins? Now, I've got to tell you, I've never done this before in one sermon, so I don't know, I don't know how well it's going to go. We've got, I want to plow through seven, okay? Um, I'm going to give you some sort of vignettes. I'm going to hit on each one just a couple minutes at a time. 
Then when we're done with the seven deadly sins, I want to talk about how to overcome. The seven deadly sins can be seen even within this scripture. The monk that came up with the seven deadly sins, his name is Evagoras Ponticus. Why in the world that name is not given to children anymore, I don't know. <laughs> who lived from 345 to 399, who got the list from scripture, but it's not spelled out verbatim. He interpreted the temptations of Christ through the seven deadly sins. It's like, you can see all of them. I won't dig through each one of them, but just turn these stones into bread, give them the people, and your job's done, Jesus. First of all, I always thought, even as a younger person, why not just turn the devil into bread at that moment? Then you wouldn't have to worry about temptation. But to follow this, this monk's logic, if you would just give the people bread, they don't have to work for it. You won't have to work so hard for your messiahship. They'll love you. Sloth abdicating responsibility or taking him up onto the pinnacle and saying hey you see the kingdoms all of this i will give you greed or the questioning of one of the temptations if you are the son of god i think i would be saying what do you mean if what do you mean if i'm the son of god pride could be so we're going to reflect on all of these seven deadly sins to see. Now just know this. Don't get too uncomfortable because we're all dealing with them. Okay, We're all reflecting on them. It's not like I'm trying to point out any one specific sin. The seven deadly sins come from the idea of, of general sin in all of our lives. The monk wrote that sin comes from the idea of hamartia, which is an archery term. There is a, an arrow in our soul, and the more bent it is, the more it strays, falls short, flies to the side. Either way, we absolutely miss the mark. All of us have sort of a, a scoliosis of the soul. And the monk was simply reminding people, if you would square up your life with the plumb line of scriptural, scriptural reality, rather than leaning in, to your sense of righting wrong, you will get closer to God. So let's reflect on these things. One, you ready? Um, I'm not doing them in the absolute traditional order. Uh, the first one is lust. Now, interestingly enough, when the monk first came up with this idea, which, by the way, two centuries later, one of the popes said, why don't we write this into church polity because this is good stuff. So it really did become a part of the um, polity of the church. But l at the time, lust, be surprised to hear it now, was one of the smaller of the deadly sins. Pride was the biggest. Today, I think it'd be different. I want to note out about each one of them that really what happens is something that God has given us very good, such as erotic love is simply taken, twisted, and turned into something different. And rather than focusing on what God has given us that is good, we get twisted and focus on what is not ours to begin with. Um, erotic love is seen all through Scripture. It was never meant as something bad. Adam and Eve were supposed to cleave to one another and become one flesh. The idea of cleave was... a uh, uh, was a euphorism for erotic love. When Abraham and Sarah were going to have another baby, late in age, Sarah laughed and said, what am I going to have, paradise again? The paradise was a euphemism for erotic love. Um, later on in Songs of Solomon, when Solomon wrote about erotic love, the whole book is a euphemism for erotic love. It was, it was something scriptural that was given to us to be good. The monk writes, what we do is we take it and we dehumanize it in the twisting. Which is to say, we remove the human aspect from erotic love. The moment erotic love comes, becomes purely about your sensual pleasure, you're twisting it. Yes, you have an itch to scratch. 
in erotic love. But when you dehumanize it, that itch becomes more like poison ivy. You can go to scratch it, but because you've taken the human aspect out of it, all you'll want to do is scratch it even more. Now, I recall some of my earliest times, personally, of dehumanizing, that is taking the human aspect out of um, erotic love. I remember when I was um, 10, 11, one of my favorite shows on TV was Duke's of Hazzard. Now, one of the most memorable characters on the Dukes of Hazard was Boss Hogg. Of course, you knew I was going to say that. <laughs> See, I know where y'all are going. Bunch of dehumanizers. Uh, you know who I'm thinking of, and I had an uncle who uh, was maybe 10 years older than me, and uh, one Christmas, he gave me a poster of Not Boss Hogg. And I put this poster up in my room. Now, did I have any chance of having a relationship with Daisy Duke? No. No, no chance in the world. Ten-year-old, even if I knew her, it wasn't going to happen. What I was doing between me and Daisy Duke had nothing to do with a human relationship. I had absolutely dehumanized. One might even say, objectified. One of the problems with dehumanizing sensual love is that no one is supposed to be an object. We're humans. Um, which is why probably I didn't see the latest movie, Dukes of Hazzard. Um, I knew it was going to bother my wife, for one thing. But then I started no noticing, um, not that I wanted to see the movie, but then I started noticing a double standard, okay? Because right around the time that, who was it? Jessica Simpson, is that who was in? That? So right around the time uh, the commercials started coming out, the totally unnoticeable commercials of Dukes of Hazzard, um, another movie came out uh, called Twilight. And uh, my wife and her sister and all the aunts within her family around a holiday time all were just giddy wanting to go see Twilight, right? And I even heard uh, testimony from my daughter who went with them later that when Edward Cullen first came out, one of the women, and I'm not going to name who, screamed with excitement. <laughs> Is that not a double standard? Now, she wasn't screaming with excitement because of the plot line of the story I want to eat you, but I love you. So exciting. No, it was, it was Edward Cullen and how beautiful he was. We all have this issue. The moment you take this, what is supposed to be a very connecting act with another human being and start separating what God meant for it, we start A, objectifying other people, but B, we start diminishing the possibility of our actually connecting with someone later. Lust. The next one is greed. Greed is, is sort of lifted up these days as kind of ambiguous, almost not good or not bad. Um, if you've seen Wall Street, excellent movie, very entertaining um, I don't know about the moral statement that it's making. Uh, Michael Douglas actually says, great actor, actually says in the movie, greed is good. Um, my question is, ask Bernie Madoff if greed is good. Go to cell block number 617-27054 and ask him if it turned out well for him and all the people that were affected by his greed. Greed stirs up dissension, Proverbs 28 says. Greed is the want simply for more. It is an appetite that can never be filled. Now, we're supposed to want to fill our lives, but to want to the extent that it can never be filled is not what God has, has for us. Um, your value in your life is not the total of your net worth. Or let me say it a different way. 
Your net worth does not equal what you are worth. The worth God has placed on you is far beyond that. And if you have transferred what you're worth to your net worth, then it may actually change not only your vision of you, but it may change your vision of God. Because of what you're, if what you're worth, you focus mainly on your net worth, then what God is worth to you, you may connect to your net worth. God is good when my net worth is increasing. Let me ask you this. If you could take all that you have, everything, investments, stocks, cars, homes, possessions, clothes, jewelry, picture it in your mind. All of it. Place it up here on the altar. Im- imagine yourself placing it on the altar. All of it. Do you feel entitled to all of that? Or do you feel like it's been given? Is it a gift? Do you feel content by all of that? Or do you just want more? Maybe greed is an issue. Then there was pride. There are good kinds of pride. I'm not saying all pride is bad. If you have a bumper sticker on the back of your car that says, my child makes all A's, I I get it. Um, Paul wrote letters to his churches saying, I'm so proud of what I'm hearing about you. Here's the difference. If your pride in someone is to build them up, that's one thing. But if your pride leads to hubris... The idea of putting other people down so as to elevate yourself, that's something different. Having a bumper sticker on the back of your car that says, my child is a, is a straight-A student is one thing. Having another bumper sticker right by it, or maybe it's not a bumper sticker, but it's an imaginary bumper sticker. You put that bumper sticker there so that other people will read in the imaginary bumper sticker, and therefore, he's better than your kid. My kid makes all A's, and therefore... Next bumper sticker, I'm a better parent than you. What is your motivation? Um, Pride strikes all of us. Uh, I was going to tell you a story. There's a story about a congressman I know. I'll leave him nameless. But he was out stumping, and he was having an outside event, and there was food, and it was fried chicken. And the way they were budgeting, you were only supposed to have one piece of fried chicken. Um, And he went through the line, and and he looked at the chicken lady, and he said, can I get two? And winked at her. And, she's, and, and she said, no, you can only have one. And she says, well, do you know who I am? I'm the, I'm, I'm the actual congressman here. And she goes, well, do you know who I am? I'm the chicken lady. And that means <laughs> you get one piece of chicken. But I'm not going to tell you that story. I'm going to tell you another story. Um, there is a story, and I'm going to name this person. Um, there's a story of Nick Saban. When he was still with uh, LSU, where uh, things were ramping up and it looked like he was headed toward a national title and it was practice one day and he was right in the middle of it. So he's leaving the office. His associate coach was like, hey, uh, you got a call here from Sports Illustrated. I I can't do it right now. I've got to get to practice. So the whole day he's out on practice, he's thinking about that phone call. Is there going to be an article written? What are they going to say? Are they going to compare me to that other coach? Is there going to be a picture taken? How am I going to pose in the picture? These are things that he's thinking. I know what I'll do. I'll hold up a sign that will relate to that other coach that I don't like, and I'll make some kind of face. He had thought all of this out. So later on that day, he comes back into the office, and the coach said, "Uh, Coach, it's Sports Illustrated. And he's like, okay, I'll take it. And he takes the line, and he says, Yes, um, this is Sports Illustrated. We're wondering if you'd like to renew your subscription. Envy. Envy is what Judah was dealing with. Cain killed Abel because of envy. There is a main commandment about coveting because of the dangerous nature of envy. Herod kills sloths of children because of his envy of Jesus. It's a very dangerous thing. Don't think that it's not. Many side effects and symptoms Let me just say this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You could be completely content with your life, but the moment you start comparing to other people's lives, 
that could change the way you view yours. There's a story of someone who was absolutely content, married, children, good home, good retirement, things were looking great, goes to a class reunion, hadn't been in 10 years, and for some reason, their jobs seem more exciting. Their children seem more developed. Their wives seemed more interesting. And on the way back home, what was a very content person, nothing changed at home. Nothing changed. But because of the way this person viewed other people, now what was a content person was a discontent person. Simply because of envy. Do you compare yourself to others? Do you want what's not yours, but someone else's? Maybe envy is your deal. There is another level of envy. Wanting other people to want what's yours is a deeper level. These are the people that are all braggadocious. You get them talking and all of a sudden they start naming where they've been, what they own, what school they've been to, just how smart their kids are, how accomplished they are. They want not only what you got, they want you to want what they got. Then there is a deeper level of envy, which is wanting someone else to fail. Now, I know that's ugly, but I have got to say, I have been in conversations before when I heard about someone's non-success and said something like, you know what? They deserve that. And I bet you I'm not the only one. Envy. Wrath. When we don't get what we want because we're angry. Okay, I gotta, I gotta plow through this one. In your wrath, you're gonna either isolate yourself, you're gonna either be a crock pot with your anger, or you're gonna take revenge. You're gonna be a flash in the pan. You have a short temper. Don't do either. Don't isolate yourself and don't take revenge. Go the middle road. The middle road is patience and prayer and forgiveness and communication okay don't let it just jump out sloth sloth is not just lazy sloth is the sin of omission not commission the devil doesn't just need you in an affair to make you drift from god but omission things you know you should be doing that you decide not to do i know i should be aggressive i know my wife's love languages I know the two that really do it for her. And if I'm not aggressive with speaking those love languages, if I'm omitting, abdicating the responsibility of doing them, I am being slothful. The sin of omission. Gluttony. Oh, my Lord. Uh, 65% of us are overweight. This is statistically speaking. The graph really took a ramp in the mid-80s. I don't need to sell this to you. I remember being a kid, and you would get a Coke out of the Coke machine, and it was a little, it looked like a shot glass compared to today. It was an eight-ounce bottle. Do you remember that? An eight-ounce bottle would quench our thirst. Uh, then in the late 80s, it went to a can, which made it look smaller, but it was rounder. 12-ounce cans. You remember those? Then we went to the, uh, in the, in the early 90s, the plastic bottle. I remember because it was 16 ounces. I thought a pound of, of sugar? Then it went to 20 ounces. Now if you go to the, uh, the gas station or, or a convenience store, the, the main thing they'll have is a 24-ounce bottle of soda. That is three times the size of the 8-ounce bottle. It's amazing. I remember working at McDonald's. The large uh, Coke was this big. I was there in high school. Uh, now it's like... A tub. Same thing with the fries. When, it, look, here's how you know when, you, when gluttony is your issue. <laughs> when you're eating something and you can't taste it anymore, you've gone too far. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, how do you overcome? All of us deal with all of these. Where you may be susceptible the most is where I think the devil thought Jesus was susceptible. And that was in his understanding of Scripture. If you noticed, 
the way the devil came at Jesus was with Scripture. But because Jesus was able to say, well, did you know it's also written, blank, that he was able to trump the temptations. One of the temptations that you see in C.S. Lewis' books, uh, Screwtape, is a demon named Screwtape who's coaching a younger demon named Wormwood that his patient, the person he's trying to put distance in between God and the person, he's coaching him to do this. Take this person's appetite for Scripture. Do away with it. If you can get them to think more about just jargon in regard to God, just God jargon, and less about scriptural realities, you will be doing your work. What does that mean, jargon? Like cleanliness is next to godliness. Or God will never give me more than I can handle. Really? What happens when your life gets slabbed and you have more than you can handle? But the only God you ever knew was the God that would never give you more than you can handle. Does that mean there's no God? You see, jargon. Scripture doesn't say God will never give you more than you can handle. Scripture says there are things in life that will be more than you can handle. But with God's help, you can stand. That's understanding Scripture rather than jargon. Research says that even Christians, church-going Christians, um, only a third of us, let's say it the other way, two-thirds of us do not read Scripture on any regular basis. Wesley said, the primary way you shape your thought about God is through Scripture. If we are not familiar with our Scriptures, we are susceptible to the wiles of the devil. Now, it doesn't mean you have to become a Greek or Hebrew expert. You just got to know what the story says. You have an advantage over the devil because of this. The devil doesn't want God's plan to work. The moment you engage Scripture and you want God's plan to work, you know more about Scripture. My question is, could I convince you about things about Scripture that aren't actually there, like the devil? Could I do that just because of your lack of understanding of Scripture? Could I say to you that Moses played tennis and you believe me or not? He served in the courts of Pharaoh. That is in Scripture. How, how can you argue me out of that if you don't know the story of Scripture? But you can if you've read it. Could I convince you that David rode a motorcycle? Well, David's triumph was heard throughout the land. <laughs> Could I convince you that there are no women in heaven? Well, in Revelation, it says for 30 minutes straight, there wasn't a sound. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's getting hot up here. Could I convince you that God drinks coffee? One of the most deep books in the Bible is called Hebrews. But you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know if you don't read Scripture that these things aren't in the Bible. After Jesus was tempted, He went to the temple. Jezebel was up in the window and fell out, broke into pieces, and the pieces multiplied and fed 5,000 people. And then 12 baskets were taken up of those pieces and fed the nations. Is that in the Bible? Yeah, it's in the Bible, but not in that way. But you wouldn't know if you don't know Scripture. So I'm going to give you just a couple ideas. Rebuild your altar of reading Scripture or build it for the first time, and that will protect you from the seven deadly sins more than anything else. Date God. Just think about it that way. How do you date someone? You set a time, you set a place, and you set a plan. That's it. Where, when, and what are we going to do? That's all you got to do. Think of where, when, what are you going to do? If you're a night owl, do it at night. 
If you're a morning person, do it in the morning. Don't do it opposite and fall asleep. So, and then, and then what is your plan? Time, place, plan. Take one book of the Bible. You've got about 30 days left in Lent. There are plenty of books in the Bible that have about 30 chapters. Pick one of the God. Don't go to the Old Testament. Okay, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy 8. That's Jesus. All right, only Jesus' favorite book in the Bible is Deuteronomy 8. Okay, he's deep. You're not that deep. Go to the New Testament. Go to the Gospels. Pick one of them with about 30 chapters and read one chapter a day. Rebuild that altar and see what happens. My first experience with taking Scripture on my own, it was at night. I decided I'm going to do it at night. I, can't, I haven't been able to get to sleep, so I'm going to do it at night. And I'm going to read the Gospels. And I'm going to tell you my, uh, my testimony. My testimony was this. I wasn't, I wasn't so shocked. I was shocked a little bit about what was in the Bible because I'd heard so much from preachers who were... Um, anyway, so what I was really shocked about was in about that much, that many pages, I started noticing change in my life that wasn't real intentional it just started happening because as i read this book uh, i started becoming personally aware of god's desire to be in relationship with me i i'd heard that before hearing it is one thing but as i read this book it started hitting me personally as a reality and it wasn't that all my interests in, in the seven deadly sins all of a sudden were gone. I'm just a, I just have scoliosis as the soul of the soul, just like everyone. But it was that God's desire to be in relationship with me just eclipsed all of those things. Read Scripture for that reason. I'll close with this image. Have you seen, uh, anyone seen The Notebook? The movie, The Notebook, or read the... Okay, let me just parse it out real quick. It relates to this. Um, in The Notebook, James Garner, great actor, is coming to read a story to someone at an assisted living area. And it just looks like when he first sits down and starts reading The Notebook to this person that maybe he reads just to everyone, but come to find out he's reading to one person. And as he opens The Notebook and starts describing the story... The story takes on the movie, really. It is, a, it is a love story that is against all odds, and it's beautiful. Every now and then it'll flash back to him reading to this older lady, but the story in the notebook is a story of love between two young people that is just, it's gripping. It grabs you from all angles. Later in the movie, as he's finishing reading the notebook one more time, and they're sitting around a dinner table, it begins to dawn on this lady, that, that story is very familiar. And then she says, that, that's our story. That's our story, isn't it? You see, her cognition of the story was coming and going based on her physical abilities, but every now and then, she would catch on. And in the moment when she caught on, that, that's us. That's our story. You could see the two of them light up. She even remembered, okay, I forget. All right. And she even asked him, how much time do we have together? And he says, well, last time it was about five minutes. And in those five minutes, the viewer, you're just caught up in their love story. This is a notebook. This is a story about your life. Someone who has been in, who knows you better than you know yourself and is in love with you in spite of the fact of what they know about you. And it's one thing to be told that from someone like me in a place like this. That's one experience. But when you start becoming familiar with the story and hearing the words of the story yourself, little by little it starts to dawn on your mind. Oh my God. God, this is, this is our story. You want me. 
And that's what eclipses the seven deadly sins. So ask yourself one of these questions as you leave today. One, which one of the seven deadly sins is most likely to erect an idol in my life? That's what you need to look for. Tear it down. Two, what keeps me from reading Scripture the most? Setting aside a time, a place, or even believing that it's actually my story too? Or three, do you feel intimacy growing in your relationship with God? Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the honesty of the gospel writers who did not leave out things like Jesus was tempted and that the devil can use God's word and that, and that we need to simply be familiar with it ourselves. Thank you for your desire to pursue us. God, help us to open up our minds and our hearts to this scriptural reality, this, this storyline that is more real than anything else sold to us by our society. God, we admit to you that our world, our culture, they want to make money off of us, and so they prey on the scoliosis of our soul. Help us to choose this Lenten season to grab hold of the one reality that is truth, in your scripture, help us to rebuild that altar that we might tear down these idols. In Jesus' name.